Typically when men are diagnosed with newly diagnosed prostate cancer, their options are surgery or radiation, but some men want to know what hormone therapy would be like in its place. So we're going to talk about the ins and outs of hormone therapy for this particular situation, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Mark Scholz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer, and he's going to talk about the ins and outs with us. So in your first book, Dr. Scholz, you wrote Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers back in 2010, and you talked about using hormone therapy as a you know, treatment for men in newly diagnosed settings when usually we talk about radiation or surgery. And for a lot of men around the world, not so much in the US, but they maybe don't have access to quality surgical centers or radiation centers and are looking to hormone therapy as a option that may be more dependable for them. So can you discuss the situation and when and when you would you not give hormone therapy as a primary treatment above surgery or radiation? What was really attractive giving testosterone deprivation back then, it was usually Lupron, to men who might be candidates for surgery or radiation to cure their disease was that the side effects of testosterone deprivation were perceived as being reversible. The specter of becoming impotent, uh, which is the number one side effect of surgery and radiation uh, as a rather daunting prospect. And to be able to temporize, shrivel up the cancer with some medicines, maybe taking them for nine months or so, and allowing testosterone then to come back, basically going on an active surveillance type protocol after the induction hormone therapy was a consideration. We don't talk about that as much in the United States in 2024 because the, we've developed focal therapies, and the idea of getting closure is really attractive. And of course, the side effects of testosterone deprivation are not unattractive. So the methodology, however, of using testosterone deprivation as a substitute for surgery or radiation wasn't lacking in its anti-cancer efficacy. We had a number of men that cycled on and off testosterone deprivation for 10 or more years, and as radiation technology improved, uh, ultimately went on and got cured, perhaps 10 years after diagnosis, when they got tired of the hormone treatment or they perceived that the side effects of the radiation would be uh, tolerable or manageable. Testosterone deprivation did not uh, run into problems with cancer spreading. In fact, one of the attractions of testosterone deprivation early on, this is before we had PSMA PET scans, and there was always a possibility of micrometastatic disease, we knew that testosterone deprivation had anti-cancer effect against micrometastatic disease, whereas surgery and radiation had no effect at all against micrometastatic disease. It also covered some of that ambiguity as to whether there might be some cancer outside the prostate that we're not detecting with the old-fashioned CAT scans and bone scans. Other issues, of course, come into play in terms of trying to mitigate side effects of hormone deprivation. It's a laborious process to go through hormone deprivation and try and compensate for the side effects, and then you go on an, a monitoring protocol afterwards. But it does keep the disease in check, and there was a percentage of men, particularly the men that had intermediate risk prostate cancer, who five years after induction treatment stayed in remission uh, without uh, any radiation or surgery. Uh, it was about half the men with Gleason 7, uh, five years after uh, 12 months we, of testosterone deprivation, in the study that we published showed continued remission five years subsequent to their um, starting on treatment. Before I get to my next question, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells the YouTube algorithm that this video helped you, and they'll push out our videos to other people who are looking for answers. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. It's a great way to support us. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. So a common concern we see with men is when they think of hormone therapy, you know, we're not attacking it directly. Maybe it feels like it's sleeping and it's not really being, you know, killed off and that you're kind of keeping cancer at bay versus taking care of it, which even from a, you know, mental position, that's really hard to think about, plus dealing with the side effects of hormone therapy itself. So what about, you know, is that true? What about these men who are going on it, you know, continually and then the cancer, you know, kind of creeps back and then goes back down again? When we were learning about this whole process ourselves, uh, after 12 months of treatment, I think we had about 100 men that had a second biopsy. These, in, that, in that era, we were doing random biopsies. And 85% uh, of the men that had had 12 months of testosterone deprivation with Lupron, this is before Zytiga, Extandi, Erlita, um, 
and Nebeka, 85% of the men had clear biopsies. The um, idea that hormone treatment merely causes the, the cancer to hibernate and it's just going to spring up again uh, is not universally true. Uh, the probable explanation for these clear biopsies and the fact that it, about half of the men with intermediate risk cancer did really well was not that their disease was cured, but that the, the clock was rolled back so far and the disease is a relatively slow-growing disease that even after five years that their disease was still quiescent and had not even come back to where its original stage was when they started treatment initially. So just as a refresher for those who are looking at hormone therapy as a treatment, what should their PSA be in order for it to be effective? All right, we're assuming, and this was the case in all the patients uh, that we treated, because they either had uh, intermediate risk or high risk disease, is that the PSA nadir would drop, drop down to less than 0.1 and that occurred in all patients uh, that had, uh, as they all, we assumed, had localized disease. And of course, if you run into a situation where the PSA doesn't decline to less than 0.1 within six months of initiating testosterone deprivation, we're, we're, you're looking at a much more consequential variant of prostate cancer, and um, the reason for the PSA not to get down to a low threshold of PSA nadir less than 0.1 needs to be elucidated. One doesn't simply just observe that and stop treatment. Uh, further investigations, scans, biopsies need to be performed to see if there's a rare uh, subtype of prostate cancer that's resistant to the hormone treatment. So in a previous video, we covered a clinical trial that spoke about using secondary hormone therapy right away when you go on a first-generation hormone therapy. Would you say that in this situation that you would start a second-generation hormone therapy right away, or would men primarily be going on Lupron, which is a first-generation hormone therapy? There have been studies performed with uh, using uh, a second generation hormone treatment as a standalone with no Lupron at all called Extandi. In uh, that trial, they were able to demonstrate that uh, men went into good remissions. Extandi has the advantage of quicker testosterone recovery when you stop the uh, treatment. The testosterone comes back uh, within 30 to 60 days. Overall effectiveness of uh, and outcomes in that clinical trial uh, indicated uh, also that a percentage of men had long, longer remissions when they stopped, but it wasn't universal, and therefore careful active surveillance after stopping treatment is necessary to detect those men that are having their disease come back more promptly as they're either going to have to go back on hormone treatment again or they're going to have to consider one of the more traditional treatments such as radiation. In your first answer, you mentioned that when men go on hormone therapy and they take these holidays, it's kind of like active surveillance if they're going to do this as a primary form of treatment. And to us, active surveillance, you know, you monitor the PSA, you get MRIs, and you look at the imaging. What would that monitoring process look like for these men who are choosing this? In our active surveillance men that have Gleason 3 plus 3, we've sort of settled in with doing PSAs twice a year and, and getting MRIs at a quality center once a year, looking for any evolutionary change in the visible lesions, and then doing targeted biopsies if there is any uh, new spots or an old spot that's growing. But the monitoring process when men have been in induced with, uh, say, Lupron or with uh, Xtandi, is uh, a little more frequent in terms of PSA testing and testosterone testing because there's quite a bit of variability in how quickly testosterone comes back and the PSA needs to be interpreted in light of how much testosterone is present. If your PSA looks fabulous and staying below 0.1 long after you stop treatment, you're not going to be very happy if your testosterone is also still zero. I think our usual protocol would be to check PSA and testosterone about every three months and uh, obtain a three tessa multi-parametric MRI once a year. So with hormone therapy, there are a list of side effects that come along, whether that's you know losing your testosterone, losing your muscle mass, the possibility of hot flashes, fatigue, and other issues. Is there a reason here in the U.S. when we have modern radiation and, and um, just you know more modern technology that you would ever tell a man, hey, I think hormone therapy would be a better option for you versus radiation considering the extent of the side effects with hormone therapy and that radiation nowadays is very effective. I can think of a maybe a specific pattern uh, where someone has a, a favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer that uh, they're not comfortable just watching. And uh, that same individual would probably put a relatively low priority on maintaining their romantic life. Uh, uh, this, I run into this not too frequently, honestly. Maybe one out of 10 men that's over 65 uh, has had their fun and, and they don't really uh, 
express any concern or, or about the thought of missing, um, you know, their libido or their uh, potency. Taking a pill like Orgavix for six months, if appropriately managed with fitness and diet and whatnot, is uh, not that heavy-handed. And these men uh, can always stop it early if they find that the uh, side effects are more than they bargained for. Orgavix wears off pretty quickly. Uh, same could be said for Xtandi or Lita or Nubeca. Uh, and you can get out of Dodge if you don't like what's happening. Also, uh, there can be competing issues with men with enlarged prostates. Uh, the uh, hormone treatments are often used to reduce the size of the prostate gland prior to radiation treatment, as you want to radiate a smaller field, not a bigger field, and that will further reduce the risk of radiation treatment. Uh, but if uh, men are uh, struggling with some borderline uh, urinary issues due to a large prostate, these hormonal medicines also shrink the prostate and may enhance their ability to urinate normally. I think there is a time to discuss it um, in men that have intermediate risk disease and aren't that concerned about uh, you know, blocking out their, their romantic life. You know, shrinking the prostate is a very common term that we've seen, you know, on our YouTube channel. How effective are hormone therapies at shrinking the prostate? Is Are there some that are better than others, or is it kind of a universal effect? There are mild anti-hormonal agents, uh, such as Avidart and Proscar, that are FDA-approved specifically for that purpose, and they're moderately effective in certain individuals, not in everybody. Typical medicines we think of for testosterone deprivation as an anti-cancer maneuver, and there's a long list of them, we've named a number of them already, are even more effective at shrinking the prostate. Interestingly, simply making the prostate s smaller is not a panacea for helping men improve their urinary quality of life. You know, getting up at night, urgency, slow urinary stream, uh, certainly can improve after these finasteride, avidart, and hormonal treatment type interventions, but it's uh, not uh, that everyone's going to get better. So many issues in this realm are related to maybe try something, see how it goes for a few months, and then decide if you're getting value, and if not, go a different direction. Other pharmaceuticals, or there's a long list of interventions for men with urinary problems we've gone into in other videos. I think the most common question I get, especially from the international audience, is, hey, my doctor put me on Lupron. Would Orgovix be better? Which one is the best in order to have the most effects? We divide hormonal treatments into first and second generation categories, and there's no evidence that there's improved anti-cancer efficacy with comparing first-generation agents with first-generation agents. Orgovix, Lupron, Firmagon, all have equal anti-cancer efficacy. Second-generation agents uh, overall have somewhat more anti-cancer efficacy compared to first-generation agents, and combining the two gives even greater efficacy. When you compare second-generation agents with second-generation agents, the anti-cancer efficacy is thought to be equivalent when they're compared with each other but superior when compared with first-generation agents. So the situation we're talking about is quite niche because of how modern medicine is specifically radiation, and I know men some have surgery. In, in just the U.S., we have so many different technologies, and the radiation, even compared to each other, is doing quite well, especially when you have things like brachytherapy and such. So the idea that you would even have hormone therapy as a primary uh, treatment right away instead of the other two is, you know, not exactly common. So in what situations would you say, you know, I know you answered kind of the, you know, intermediate your risk patient, but are there any other factors that men should think about if they are going to choose this as a primary and really what would be kind of the process that they would go through in order to come to this conclusion? The other situation where this might come up is in people who are uh, quite concerned about the potential effects of surgery and radiation. You know, they're being told that their variant of prostate cancer isn't that serious, that they have time and that they can reflect on their options before jumping into something irreversible like surgery or radiation. The anti-cancer efficacy of testosterone deprivation therapy is indisputable. It's, it's as good as radiation or surgery in keeping people alive for 10 years. The role could be something for men that are maybe on the edge of doing active surveillance but are just can't get comfortable with that idea. They might find psychological comfort in uh, taking a, a medication which will shrivel their cancer up rather dramatically and uh, might not cause as many side effects as many people would uh, think that it would entail. And, of course, as we mentioned previously, men can uh, stop treatment now with 
medicines like Extani, Orgovix, or Lita, and it'll be out of your system in uh, about 60 days. So in today's video, we talked about hormone therapy being used as a primary treatment instead of surgery or radiation. Now, this is kind of a niche situation, and before we had modern radiation and surgery, and we had modern scans, you know, these this was kind of more of an option, as Dr. Scholz mentioned in his book from 2010. However, nowadays, since we do have those options in the US, we don't see this happen a lot, but internationally, we do see this situation occurring where maybe men in other countries don't have access to quality centers for surgery and quality radiation. So it's important that, you know, if you are looking at hormone therapy as an option and maybe you don't have this and you're either in that specific situation that Dr. Schultz talked about or you're in an international place where you don't have access to this, your quality of life still matters. So please write down the side effects of hormone therapy and talk to your doctor about what you can do. I know when we talk about you know weightlifting, especially for hormone therapy patients, it can almost seem slightly insensitive because you're thinking, I'm in pain, I am weak and tired, and my joints hurt. How could you tell me to work out? Well, in a lot of the studies, it shows that 80% of a lot of the fatigue and the issues that men are having are helped and alleviated by weight training. So if you can work out with somebody, if you can go to the gym, it's very important. That muscle mass just helps you throughout the process of hormone therapy and also helps you just handle other treatments that may have to, have to happen along the line. Studies have shown time and time again how important weight training is, especially in men over 65 years old. So if you can get a buddy, you can go to a gym or find some way to do it, it's really important. There are lots of weightlifting and resistance training, you know, even without weights and just using your own body weight on YouTube. So I would really encourage you to watch those videos and to try to get some sort of protocol for yourself. Now, if you need help with any your particular case or you need help with anything that we talked about in this video, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These men have been on hormone therapy and they can tell you what they did and give you information, not advice, but all of this is really to bolster your information so that when you go talk to your doctor, you're having a shared decision-making process, you feel like your needs and your concerns are being brought to the table and your doctor can then advise you from there. These medical teams work really hard and they are on your side and we just wanna make sure that from your perspective, you're as educated as possible so that again, your quality of life is being taken care of. Now, if you would like more information about prostate cancer, you can visit our website at pcri.org and please subscribe to this channel. If you have other topics or comments you would like us to cover with our you know, interviews with Dr. Scholes, you can go ahead and leave them in the comment section below this video. Please remember most of all that you're not alone. We care about you and I hope you have a great week.